Hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Uranium Market Minute. My name is Justin Hewn. I am your host and the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium and publishes on a regular monthly basis. Thank you again for tuning in. Really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for all the great comments and questions in the in the YouTube comment section. Thanks for all the support on Twitter. Really been appreciating all the all the great comments. Um, I'm glad that you all are enjoying this. I've been enjoying doing this every day and. It's nice to have this discussion for whatever reason. I never really tire of talking about uranium. I guess that's a good thing. Um, before we get started, I'll again mention that nothing in this video is intended to be investment advice. I am not a financial advisor, and this is not financial advice. Always do your own due diligence when investing, and always take responsibility for your own actions. All right, let's get right into the daily scoreboard. I'm going to discuss the price of uranium, the SPOT, uh, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust flows, and the ETF flows. Uh, the price of uranium spot price continues to tick down today, $40.50 uh, mid-market. Um, it continues to tick down. Today, it seems like there's a bit more volume because I believe that Sprott was again in the market. Um, so it's, it looks to me like there's a motivated seller. I don't know who that is. I don't know their reasoning for doing so, but certainly there's a motivated seller in the market right now, and, uh, and Sprott just keeps dropping their bid. That's what I believe is going on. Um, they were back in the market yesterday, Sprott was, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. They acquired 400,000 pounds of uranium yesterday, and they raised another 15.4 million through issuing new shares through the ATM. They, at the end of the day yesterday, they ended with 13.7 million in cash and closed the day at a 5.7% premium to NAV, which means going into the day's trading, they could start to issue shares again. And I believe that they did throughout the day today. We'll have to find out in a couple of hours the amount that they that they added and if they bought any more pounds, which I believe they probably did. Um, since August 17th, when their ATM went live, they have raised 483.9 million and acquired 11.3 million pounds of uranium, just a huge, huge new demand source for the, for the uranium market. Turning to the ETFs, both URA and URNM reported increases in outstanding shares. Uh, that, that was reported this morning. So these shares were issued yesterday or perhaps even Friday. Um, URA increased by 400,000 shares, URNM by 100,000. What that translates to is a mandated uh, purchasing amount of 6.7 million for URA and 7.8 million. Um, that money comes into these, to these funds. They issue shares uh, to raise cash and they buy uh, more of their underlying holdings. Um, so what is that? 13, 14 million in mandated buying just from the share issuance yesterday and or Friday. Uh, the two ETFs now have a combined uh, AUM, assets under management of just over one and a half billion. Pretty substantial. Um, the trading action in the charts today was actually surprisingly strong. We did have an up day in the broad market um, as compared to the last few days, which helps, of course. Um, but considering the spot price continues to tick down and the miners are moving, the miners are moving before the metal. We kind of know what that means if, if you've been in the precious metal space at all. Usually that means the miners are sniffing something out. I believe they're sniffing out a, a seasonal move that's going to come here quickly. But let's take a look at the charts. Starting with URA, we didn't quite have the follow through I was looking for in volume. We had a huge volume day yesterday. Um, still uh, definitely reasonable volume. If you, if you look at this uh, horizontal line that's created by the by the pointer here, more volume that came in on a daily basis than almost every day this year, with an exception of the past three or four weeks. Still pretty substantial, although about half the volume of yesterday. Um, the stock is holding up pretty well overall. Um, in my opinion, this continues to look like accumulation, uh, likely to be um, from institutional money, uh, primarily due to the, the liquidity of the ETFs. Um, the ETFs usually see mostly institutional funds coming in and flowing out of them rather than retail. Um, let's take a look at URNM. Uh, URNM, again, is 100% allocated to uranium, uh, whereas URA is only 70% allocated, so it's more of a pure play. Similar looking chart, but a little bit more positive. We're seeing this 20-day start to roll over here, reacting to the previous couple of weeks of, uh, of weakness, but the 50-day and 200-day still moving up strongly. Volume dropped off quite a bit from yesterday, but still uh, respectable indicators looking like they're recovering. Uh, again, also looking like accumulation, nothing really strongly directional here. Let's take a look at the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Volume, again, relatively low. 
a pretty decent sized down candle. So it's likely they close the day. I think that this move in the in the trust probably outpaced the, the downward move in the spot price. So they, they may have still ended the day at a slight premium to NAV, but certainly it's going to be less than that 5.7% premium to NAV that they closed yesterday. Overall, we're still looking at um, at a sector that's trying to find its, its, its place before the next move, whether that's up or down. My opinion is that move will be up because of this seasonality. And because we're seeing the volume start to tick up in those ETFs, that's a good sign. Uh, we have this strong seasonality that typically happens from October through January or February, just about every year. And I do believe that's going to happen again this year, especially considering that um, the entire nuclear fuel market is now awake to what's going on with Sprott and with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. So I, I do believe that um, the seasonality is coming. Let's take a look at the mailbag and see if there's a question in there for us today. Justin, what are the implications of Japan's new economy and trade minister saying that he plans to restart Japan's idled nuclear plants to meet their climate initiatives? That's a great question. Okay, so in April, um, Japan pledged to for um, clean energy to be just under 50%, 40-something percent of their total energy uh, production by 2030. That's a huge, huge move that they're expecting as uh, their, their energy currently is about 75% fossil fuel based for which 100% of that fuel is imported. Japan geographically is a small country, not hugely rich in resources. And they pretty much need to import um, all of their resources when it comes to energy production, uranium included. The bonus for uranium is that it's so incredibly dense, energy dense that they can store years and years and years and years of fuel, um, decades of fuel in a small area. I mean, in a number of, what, you know, a couple of warehouses for the, in, and power a huge part of the grid uh, on this stored energy. It's, it's so incredibly energy dense and it's so much more efficient than the constant importation of coal or oil or, or natural gas for that matter. Um, so Japan before Fukushima had 54 reactors uh, up and running and it was almost 30% of their grid. Um, after Fukushima, they, they shut all of those reactors off, didn't start restarting them until, two, until 2015. Fukushima, again, was in uh, 2011, March of 2011. Um, so currently, they have 10 reactors up and running. Of those 54 that were shut down, 10 have restarted. And there are 16 that are going through the process of, of safety approval before restart. So basically, in order for them to meet that 2030 goal, pretty much all of those 16 reactors will need to restart. Um, and that's, um, that's a pretty substantial goal for the country. And what that really means for, um, for us as investors is that what used to be the second largest consumer of uranium on the planet and uh, Japan, that has basically been written off in terms of new demand coming back in, uh, could really be another signal to investors that this, this bull market for uranium and the sentiment around nuclear has in fact really truly shifted to see Japan come back online. Um, so as I said, it's already happening. And in order for them to meet these climate goals, it will continue to happen. And based on this new um, energy minister, it looks like there's more support from the government for that to continue to happen, uh, safety approvals pending. So there's been a number of uranium analysts and, and pundits that have mentioned that um, you know Japan coming back online is the catalyst that the uranium sector is waiting for. I never believed that. That wasn't something that I ever bet on. And I'm glad because we've seen big moves in the sector already before this has even really happened. But um, most people who model out the supply and demand dynamic for uranium, um, they usually model a few million pounds of uranium being sold into the spot market coming from Japan. It's, it's, you know, they're not huge sellers and it's believed that most of their inventory um, is being held in the form of, of fabricated fuel, um, not in U308, not in UF6, primarily because fabricated fuel is, is so much more uh, dense in size and it's already specified to each individual reactor. However, I'm sure that they continue to sit on some stock of U308 and UF6 and it's likely substantial. And will that come back into the market? Don't know. It's, it's understood and widely believed that they paid much higher prices than what we're seeing right now for that material. So 
perhaps if we get up to a higher price, some of that material will free up and come back into the market just to finally get it off the balance sheets of some of these reactors that aren't going to come back online. I don't recall the exact number. Some of Japan's reactors have been permanently closed, but there, are, like I said, there's 16 that are that are slated for approval that are going through those final stages of, of safety approval. So to the extent that Japan um, does continue to bring reactors online, that does two things that um, that limits the amount of whatever standing inventory they might have could come back in the market because they're going to need that for their own energy security. And two, that um, that creates more new demand, um, at least on a structural basis when you're calculating on an annual basis, rather than saying, okay, well, they have new demand, but they're sitting on this inventory, but you're still counting that demand when it comes to calculating the amount of uranium that's consumed on an annual basis based on the reactors that are presently running. So it matters in those structural demand, um, supply and demand analyses. And, and lastly, of course, it's, it's investor sentiment. So when investors see that this thing that has been talked about over and over ad nauseum for the last decade is finally actually happening on top of all of the other spinning parts that are bullish for the sector, um, you know, finally, nuclear finally getting its acclaim as as a base load source of green energy. Um, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and other players coming into space buying physical utilities finally waking up the big jump in, in long term pricing that I mentioned in yesterday's market minute. All of these factors continue to accumulate on the bullish side for uranium, the energy crises going on in multiple countries, etc. So it's just one more piece of that puzzle, and it's it's a good sign. And nuclear really is a good thing for Japan. Um, this one accident that resulted in zero deaths, um, but just absolutely slammed sentiment. It's important to recognize that these accidents can happen, to learn from them, to uh, bolster the safety mechanisms in place, which much of the world did after Fukushima, by the way, in many different countries, including Japan, um, and then to embrace uh, embrace the, the positives about nuclear, which are vast and understated, in my opinion. So, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no energy source that's perfect. But... For a country like Japan, nuclear makes a lot of sense because it's so small, because they can store an immense amount of energy in a small amount of space. It's, it's really a no-brainer. And they have the reactors there. They don't even need to build any new one. They're literally sitting there waiting to be started. So that's a positive sign. Um, I appreciate the question. And um, as I mentioned before, if, if anybody's interested in receiving a sample monthly newsletter from us, go ahead and send us an email, support at uraniuminsider.com. Um, we'll go ahead and send you that sample newsletter from a previous month. And I also want to mention that um, new subscribers, you get immediate access to all of our archived material that we put out over the last two years. All the previous new newsletters are recommended stock picks, um, the weekly watch list that I put out every Sunday, and you'll also be able to participate in member only webinars that we do once a month. So um, if you're interested, go ahead and send us an email support at uraniuminsider.com. We'll send you that sample letter answering any questions you might have about our service. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Cheers.